Amen. Please be seated. Well, that hymn really prepares us to hear the text tonight from Luke chapter 22, verses 1 through 23, as we continue this journey with Jesus and discover his amazing love for us. I want you just to hear the words tonight. Don't try to read them as much as listen to them and be in a restful place. You can close your eyes if that helps or, or, or eyes open, but uh, consider the words and allow the Lord to speak to you through them. Now the festival of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, was near. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to put Jesus to death for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered into Judas called Iscariot, who was one of the 12. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers of the temple police about how he might betray him to them. They were greatly pleased and they agreed to give him money. So he consented and he began to look for an opportunity to betray him to them when no crowd was present. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover meal for us that we may eat it. They asked him, where do you want us to make preparations for it, O Lord? Listen, he said to them, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a, a jar of water will meet you Follow him into the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs already furnished. Make preparations for us there. So they went and they found everything as he had told them and they prepared the Passover meal. When the hour came, he took his place at the table and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine, until the kingdom of God comes. Then Jesus took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And Jesus did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is a new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on this table. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to that one by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to ask one another, which one of them could it be who would do this? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we pray again that you would open our spirit and our minds to the message, the special word that you have for each of us tonight, and to our world, as once again we remember this night in which you broke bread and poured out a cup and gave it to your disciples. So as the full moon of Passover rises over Jerusalem, the last night of Jesus' earthly life begins. And in the hours before Jesus betray was betrayed, we read in Luke's gospel that there were two meetings that took place. One that intended on destruction, and the other one that intended on, I'm going to call it, construction or reconstruction. 
And I first want to, I want us to think about this meeting in which destruction was, was in mind. Obviously, Jesus had many friends, and the swelling Passover crowd was attracted to him. But the chief priests and the scribes and the religious leaders were intent on becoming his enemies, those who sought to protect the status quo and who were growing angrier by the day at Jesus' ways and means. He had cleansed the temple. Remember when he walked into Jerusalem? That really angered those who were in charge. He questioned their leadership. He told the people to beware of their hypocrisy. And with divine authority, he claimed to be the rock on which they would stumble and fall. So Jesus goes toe-to-toe and head-to-head with some of the most powerful people in Jerusalem. And he predicted that even the temple would be swept away, the place that symbolized the center of their power and their authority. They needed a plan to finally be rid of Jesus, to be rid of this troublemaker. But they were afraid of the people, and they needed a plan. But in their wildest dreams, they could not have imagined that the one who would bring them this plan was actually one of Jesus' own disciples. Judas knew where Jesus retired at night. He knew that he left the city and went to the Mount of Olives to pray and to sleep. He knew where Jesus could be arrested out of the sight of the crowds, where it would not attract so much attention. It's important to add that while the plot to destroy Jesus involved some of the religious leaders and Jesus' own disciples, the Gospels make clear that behind all of this was really a great conflict between the evil one and God's own good and beautiful plan for this world. It was a cosmic conflict. And I think it's, and I know it's the reason that this cross is on the wall behind us. It's how Jesus was able to turn the darkness of that moment into the light of God's goodness. And Luke mentions himself that Satan entered Judas. Satan entered Judas. That there is in some way a cosmic work of evil going on in an effort to really destroy what Jesus was seeking to build. Jesus had come to Jerusalem in the days leading up to the Passover. And of course, that's the time when the the Jewish people celebrated and continue to celebrate their deliverance, their exodus from, from Egypt. And perhaps the plotters, the religious leaders, the betrayer, and maybe Satan himself enjoyed the idea that this would really be Jesus' exodus. They would finally get rid of him once and for all. But Jesus knows better. And he has a meal with his disciples with, I'm going to call it construction in mind, salvation in mind, restoration in mind, redemption in mind. In that upper room, Jesus wanted to paint an unforgettable picture of what he was about to do for his disciples, but not just for his disciples, for the whole world. This was much bigger than his little band of 12 people who you would assume would soon forget all about him in about 24 hours. This was a plan for all of humankind. And the Passover, this historical event in the life of Israel, was the picture that Jesus used. And through this meal, his disciples would always remember the meaning of his death, what it was really all about. And I want to share just a couple of thoughts about that. First of all, remember that I came to set you free. Remember that I came to set you free. Jesus says, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer 
For I tell you that I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And if we've been to church long enough, and even if we haven't, it's good to remember that the lamb that is eaten at Passover is symbolic of that lamb that's sacrificed on the eve of the very first Passover, the lamb whose blood kept the people of Israel safe from the power of death that hovered over the homes of Egypt as they passed over the old people of God. And on the cross, Jesus would give his life so that the power of sin and hatred and bitterness and pride and injustice and despair and death and hell itself might also pass over us and not land on us and make its home in us and destroy us from the inside out and our world. And then those things, those powers would be revealed as powerless in the face of the saving grace and love and goodness of the living God. It was a Messianic Jew who pointed out to me once that when the Israelites sprinkled lamb's blood on the doorpost that they were told in Exodus chapter 12 to begin by dipping the hyssop branch at the base, the threshold of the door, then on the lintel, the doorpost, and then on either side of the door, making the sign of a cross. I couldn't help but just smile with joy to think about that simple motion that many Christians today make as they cross themselves, remind themselves, or if you're Orthodox, you go like this, of, of the, the cross of Jesus, the power of Jesus to overwhelm the powers of darkness in our own lives. So remember, I came to set you free. And remember, I came to feed you with my life. I came to feed you with my, my life. During the Passover, we know unleavened bread was eaten. Leaven at that time was a symbol. It was kind of a symbol of impurity or a symbol of sin. And I have a Jewish friend that I row with and he talks about his memories of getting rid of all the, the leaven in the house on Passover. That was one of the things that children helped, helped their families to do. And according to Deuteronomy 16.3, the head of the family would say, this is the bread of affliction which our fathers had to eat as they came out of Egypt. The bread of affliction. And Jesus, he takes this bread of affliction and he actually identifies with it. He, he identifies with it. As though he's saying, yes, their affliction and all the affliction, right, that we experience in this life. And I take it upon myself and I identify with it. And I walk with you in your humanity, in my humanity as the son of God. But I suffer with you and I, and I eat this bread. And my suffering is not just suffering in futility, but it's suffering with victory. I come here to undo what has been done, to bring deliverance. And this is my body, Jesus says again, which is given for you in the mystery of the, of the sacrament. This is my body, which is given for you. When we eat a piece of bread, we know what happens, right? The carbohydrates and the fats and the proteins get broken down and uh, they get metabolized, and they become part of us. Our cells actually use that energy uh, to manufacture more cells and to, to give us physical life. Isn't that amazing that all of the things that we eat are processed by our bodies and actually become a part of us? And there's a sense in which when we eat the bread, the living bread of Christ, he becomes a part of us. He becomes a part of us spiritually. That we're sustained and repaired and restored and forgiven and renewed by the bread of life. And then finally, remember, I came to build a bridge. 
I came to build a bridge for you to God. At the end of the Passover meal, a cup of blessing was always shared, and this cup, which Jesus now shared with his disciples at the end of the Passover, would probably re represent this new covenant in, in, in blood, in his blood. And what did he mean when he said, this is, this is the cup, this is the blood of the new covenant in my blood? You know, there's so many ways these words have, tried, have been interpreted over the years. And I thought this, this, this evening, I just wanted to say this. First of all, a covenant is an agreement between two people. And Jesus is saying this is a new agreement, a new coming together. An agreement is designed to bring two parties together, two people together. We agree. And sometimes that agreement is written down, sometimes it's verbal. But an agreement is designed to bring people together. Just like a bridge enables people to cross a great divide or a deep canyon. Or I think even as Israel crossed over the sea and the Lord made a way for them through the sea. Jesus says, I am the new covenant and the new agreement. I am the bridge. This week we saw in Baltimore stunning video of the Francis Scott Key Bridge as it was destroyed by a cargo ship that had lost power. That had to be terrifying. Uh, a captain unable to steer a ship of that size or direct it, but calling Mayday, Mayday to the bridge tower and able to save many lives just by, by doing that. But we saw that bridge completely destroyed in about five seconds and there were, many, there were many lives lost because of it. And our president promised Baltimore that the bridge would be reconstructed, which is a great consolation, I'm sure. And jobs will be saved eventually, and shipping will be restored. But of course, the grief of those who, who had lost someone to death will take a lot longer to heal and to repair. And when Jesus spoke of a new covenant, he was talking about the promise of a different kind of reconstruction project, a, a new bridge, a bridge that's not built by human hands, a bridge that's built by God, that crosses those chasms that we cannot cross, the distance between God and this broken world that's caused by all the things that we see, can continue to see today right? Hatred and pride and greed and selfishness and the feelings also of despair and hopelessness that rob us of joy. And Jesus wants to, wants to make it known that he has come to build a bridge across those things that would divide us from one another and separate us from God and seek to destroy our lives. And it's a bridge that's built by his sacrifice and his grace and his forgiveness and his love. And the very act of taking this bread and drinking this cup and welcoming that very same spirit, the spirit of Jesus, into our own lives, one person at a time, millions of people, billions of people tonight, Two billion people across the world touches families, touches communities, touches cities, brings restoration of hope to our own lives in the midst of the darkness that we continue to see around us. And when that built Baltimore Bridge is rebuilt years from now, it will be a wonder to drive or walk across it again. But right now, there is an invitation. There's an invitation right now from Jesus to walk across his bridge. A much greater bridge. The bridge that brings us into the presence of God and enables us to sit down at his table and receive the gift of new and eternal life. Now, those can be simply words. 
But I maintain that as we truly walk with Jesus, and as he truly walks with us, miracles are happening. Lives are transformed. And wounds are healed. And we become Jesus' healing people. I love the fact that when Jesus sat down with his disciples, that he sat down with his betrayer. I love that he sat down with the disciple who would deny him three times. I love the fact that he sat down with all the others who ran as fast as they could before he was arrested. I love the fact that when he sat down with them, he also, in a sense, sat down with all those who are apathetic or even hostile to him. Certainly, he died for them, not just for his friends. Indeed, he gave his life for those who were not even born yet, who didn't even know him yet. He gave his life for you and for me. And Paul sums it up this way. God shows his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's a lot of love. So this meal is where we remember that Jesus came to build a bridge between us and God, and everyone who will come should know that there is a place for you at that table. Now I want to invite our spirit singers to come and sing our communion hymn.